Welcome to the first in a series of Australian Naval History podcasts produced by the University of New South Wales, Canberra, in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, the Submarine Institute and the Navy's Sea Power Centre. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoy the podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Professor Tom Frame, a former Naval officer and now Director of the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict and Society at the Defence Force Academy. We hope these podcasts will be of general interest to anyone with a concern for naval history and the seas, and be of special interest though to three audiences. The first are students of Australian naval and maritime affairs, past and present. The second are people interested in understanding more about the place of ships and the seas in Australian history. The third are researchers wanting a sense of the most recent thinking on some key issues in naval history. For more information on the very active Naval Studies Group at UNSW Canberra, please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Naval Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. The first podcast in this series deals with a dramatic event that created alarm and anxiety throughout Australia. I'm talking about the Japanese midget submarine attack in Sydney Harbour on the night of the 31st of May 1942. The Pacific War had come to the nation's largest city and exposed its vulnerability to attack from the sea. So began a naval engagement in the harbour of Australia's largest city, and it would involve more RAN ships than any other action of World War II. To discuss what happened and what it meant for Australia and its people, I'm joined today by Rear Admiral Peter Briggs from the Submarine Institute of Australia, who commanded two submarines, as well as the Australian Submarine Squadron during a long and distinguished naval career. He's speaking from his home on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria. In the studio, we have Vice Admiral Peter Jones, a member of the Naval Studies Group, author of Australia's Argonauts, and president of the Australian Naval Institute. We also have Dr. David Stevens of the Australian War Memorial, another former Naval officer who has written a number of books on submarine and anti-submarine operations. His latest book, entitled In All Respects Ready, deals with the Royal Australian Navy during World War I. And it won the 2015 Frank Rose Prize for Maritime History. It's good to have you with us, and we look forward to the conversation that's now to follow. Let me begin with you, Peter Jones. What was the state of the Pacific War in June of 1942? So by that time, uh, the Japanese had made their largest gains in the Pacific. So they had taken Rabaul in January, they'd taken uh, Singapore in the following month in February, and then the Dutch East Indies in uh, March. And uh, they had just uh, battled the, uh, the US and the Australian forces in the Battle of the Coral Sea, and that had completed by the 8th of May. And so their uh, uh, progress had been stopped, but the Japanese still very much wanted to be able to um, fortify that perimeter of, uh, of acquisition that they had gained at that point. Was there an aura of invincibility about them still at this time, or did people think that they were vulnerable to defensive attack? I think there was still very much that aura because um, I think it's important to bear in mind that the Japanese onslaught from Pearl Harbour through to the, uh, the, the Asian mainland, that was the largest military operation that hitherto had uh, taken place. The scale and the range of operations had been staggering. And so there was huge concern in, um, uh, in Australia in particular about the Japanese threat. And uh, Prime Minister uh, Curtin had pushed the point that the, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea was, if you like, the, the end of the beginning, but there was this long uh, war ahead of us and that the Japanese threat was very real. Now, I need to ask you this slightly controversial question. 
Is the Coral Sea, was the Coral Sea, some kind of precursor to an invasion of Australia at that time? Uh, no, it wasn't. Uh, the, the, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea was uh, a, uh, a conflict which the Americans and the Australians were able to stop the Japanese from invading Port Hornsby by the sea. And the Japanese plans at that point did not envisage uh, an occupation of, of Australia. What they really saw was the ability, if they could take New Guinea, then they could really impose themselves between Australia and the American mainland. And also, back to that earlier point I made about uh, the ability to uh, provide security to their perimeter of their uh, acquisitions up to that point. Which was very large. It, huge. A huge area. Now, David Stevens, we've moved from early May of 1942, the Battle of the Coral Sea. Can you help us understand what happened between then and the end of May 1942, perhaps the weeks, days and months, prior to the midget submarine attack in Sydney Harbour? Yeah, we well, have to go back a little bit um, to March, actually, in '42, when Admiral Yamamoto, who was the Japanese Commander-in-Chief, um, directed his submarine forces to start looking at ways or planning for how they could help to prevent um, the Allied forces, particularly the Americans, obviously, of building up and providing ships, warships, that could then attack their, um, their defensive uh, perimeter. Um, and obviously, the Japanese invasion of Port Morty was part of that uh, uh, ability, or sorry, intention to create a fortification. And the Japanese, when they attacked Darwin, had already made that untenable for Allied shipping. So the Japanese were starting to look at these more distant ports that they could work out how to, um, to stop a build-up there, make them untenable for the Allies. And that included ports in the Indian Ocean and also in the South Pacific, particularly Suva and Fiji, and of course, Sydney Harbour. And the Japanese planning is always very complicated, and that was one of the weaknesses. Their planning tended to be too complicated for their own good. And so rather than concentrate on a particular target, they started to think about ideas of how they could attack both in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific at the same sort of time. And this is where the midget submarine campaign came in, in that they were looking at ways of getting into these harbours and destroying shipping in those harbours. And one half of the submarine special attack force, which was the midget submarine force, went to the Indian Ocean and one half went to the Pacific Ocean. And on the 10th of May, the, Jap the Pacific um, part of the squadron went up to Truk, which was the Japanese main fleet headquarters, to pick up midget submarines for an attack in the south. And at that stage, it wasn't certain whether it was going to be in Suva or in Sydney. One of the things the Japanese did with their submarines, they were always very um, innovative, was um, put aircraft. And a lot of their reconnaissance uh, was carried out by these submarine-launched aircraft. And they'd certainly been to Australia already, and in fact New Zealand. And they'd sent their, one of their submarines, the I-29, down to look at the, um, the coast of Australia and Sydney. And they'd done a flight over Sydney Harbour in early May when they said, yes, this is building up, there is shipping in there. And eventually, it, uh, just before the attack, the, um, another submarine called the I-21 launched its aircraft and said there's more shipping in Sydney than in, um, in Suva. So the decision was made to go to, to Sydney. But what about Mackay or what about Brisbane or what about Melbourne? I mean, what made Sydney the place that, from what I'm hearing you say, was the main place they looked? Because there were other significant ports at that time. Yes, but not so much for warships. Right. Sydney is certainly the main Australian base, and that's where the Americans would tend to, to congregate, especially their larger ships. Um, places like Brisbane aren't really good for larger warships, and the Japanese, with the fixation on battleships, for example, um, were always looking to destroy those, rather than perhaps the more useful assets a lot of the time, which was escort ships particularly for later in the war when you're trying to protect convoys, etc. So when did they decide that it would be Sydney and what preparations did they make? So they decided on Sydney about a week or so before the attack on the 31st of... Uh, the attack took place on the 31st of May, as you've mentioned, and the submarines congregated. There was um, three, three mother submarines with midgets, which they picked up in truck, as I mentioned. There actually should have been four, but one of the mother submarines were sunk by an American submarine on its way to truck. So they only ended up with these three midget submarines and the two uh, float plane carrying submarines. And so they assembled off 
the coast um, just before the attack and on the night of the, uh, well, sorry, the early afternoon of the uh, 31st of May, three midgets were launched. And Peter Jones, were there a lot of good targets in Sydney Harbour? Was it the right time if they'd waited perhaps a week or they'd been a week earlier? How would that have made a difference to the kind of uh, environment they were finding when they entered Sydney Harbour? So as I said earlier that uh, uh, this attack uh, came after the Battle of the Coral Sea, so there was a number of ships which had taken part in the Battle of the Coral Sea. And so there was the US heavy cruiser, the Chicago. There was uh, the Australian heavy cruiser, the Canberra. Also the light cruiser, Adelaide. And a half dozen escorts. And also the uh, auxiliary mine layer, the Bungaree. So there was a, a range of ships. Um, and in fact, uh, a, um, uh, a couple of ships had left the harbour um, within uh, 24 hours of the attack. But by the nature of ports and the uh, port movements, it's a bit of potluck about what you, you know. When is the ideal time? But there was enough there to make it worthwhile. It wasn't the case that people could say afterwards, if only they'd waited. There was enough there for them to have a successful attack. Oh, exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. There was also uh, David Stevens, a small vessel called the Cutable, which was not a heavily armed warship. What can you tell us about Cutable? Cuttable was an old Sydney ferry that had been converted into a depot ship, basically an accommodation vessel. So it was tied up alongside Garden Island and sailors would sleep there. All right, we need to hold that information about Cuttable because the targets, Peter Jones, you've mentioned did not include Cuttable, but Cuttable has a significant place in this story. Let me now come to you, Peter, Peter Briggs, if I can. Can you tell us something about the main characteristics of these Jap Japanese midget submarines? Because People might think, oh, they only just take one man, they may only be 12 foot long, but if they've seen them perhaps at the War Memorial, they'd know otherwise. But can you tell us about the submarines and also their motherships? What made them special and different? Yes, the uh, submarines were intended initially as a, a weapon against major fleet units in, in a big fleet engagement. And it became obvious early on uh, that that was not a practical role for them. Uh, they shifted then to this role of harbour attacks uh, and we used to get against Pearl Harbour for the, fir for the first time uh, without notable success. Uh, they were not a suicide weapon. Uh, they were intended to get back, but they were certainly a very high risk and the crews manning the submarines uh, generally didn't expect to get back. They had a crew of two, an officer and a technical petty officer, extremely cramped, uh, three compartments, the torpedo tubes in the forward compartment, uh, a watertight bulkhead, uh, a control room which was filled with batteries, two battery banks, uh, and the control area itself, which was very restricted, uh, room for one man to stand up, otherwise uh, you had to sit. Um, a watertight door at the after end of that led to the propulsion area with the big electric motor. Uh, from Apart from the control area, there was nowhere you could stand up in the submarine. You could crawl uh, down between the batteries to get to the uh, weapon space or to the motor room back aft. They carried two uh, large torpedoes, 350 kilogram warhead, uh, which had a very good performance, 44 knots, five and a half thousand metres, and were significant, significantly in advance of anything the Allies had in their torpedoes at the time. The submarines had a single periscope for navigation, and that was a uh, uh, a weakness in the light loss and, and coverage of that. Um, that was their, ma their main sensor for navigation and attacking. Uh, they had a gyro compass and after Pearl Harbor they modified the submarines to put in an emergency compass, uh, which had been a problem at Pearl Harbor. Uh, they also put better uh, net cages uh, forward to stop the uh, harbor defense nets snagging around the bow. Uh, they put a taller periscope in and they provided a hatch between the um, mother submarine and the midget to allow the crews to get in and out whilst the submarines were dived. Um, the submarines also carried two demolition charges to, in order to be able to destroy the submarine if they were, were caught. Uh, all in all, they uh, had significant drawbacks, a very long, thin shape. Uh, 40 odd metres long. It's, it's almost like a torpedo uh, with a, a control room in the middle. Uh, 
and so they're, they're fairly unstable and prone to uh, broaching, coming up to the surface out of control or going deep again out of control. Their long thin shape meant quite ponderous to turn. They had only small control surfaces to control the depth and the heading. So they were not very agile uh, for the role they took on in getting into the harbour. In terms of attacking the ship, the torpedo had to be aimed by eye. There was no torpedo calculator. A firing by eye is not uh, that difficult as long as you go about it in an organised fashion. In fact, uh, the RA and Oberons were trained to do that as a breakdown method. Uh, but we, if we get to talking about some of the attack attacks themselves, there were some interesting choices made by the crews. The crews were formed in April 1941 and went through a training in preparation for Pearl Harbour attacks. They had another training period early in the first quarter of 1942 prior to embarking in truck but in fact, the number of hours they would have had dived in these submarines would have been fairly limited. So they're not, not highly experienced. And given the uh, habit the submarines had of, of uh, surfacing or diving out of control, it made them very difficult. And all of them were detected on the surface in both the Pearl Harbor and the Sydney attacks. And can I ask you, Peter Briggs, you've brought submarines in and out of Sydney Harbour many, many, many times. Are there particular challenges bringing a submarine, now you've come through on the surface, but are there particular challenges navigating in through the heads of Sydney Harbour? Uh, or was it the case that it was a fairly standard harbour in terms of currents, uh, the movement of the water, those kinds of things? Uh, it's it's a, an involved harbour. It's not uh, a difficult harbour to get into, but you, you've got a choice of... Uh, coming through the heads is fairly easy. It's a wide open area, and some of the navigation lights around the heads were burning on the night of the attack. Uh, you then have to choose between the eastern and the western channel. The western is the most uh, straightforward, but on the particular night, it was protected partially by an incomplete boom. Uh, so the both channels used by uh, the midgets in getting uh, into the harbour. Uh, you then have to penetrate, go down past Bradley's Head and get up into the area where the shipping, Chicago and Canberra and the other major units were around Garden Island. Uh, not easy in the dark. It was a full moon night, but it was very cloudy. So there wasn't a lot of light, uh, stray light around. Uh, and it would have been quite a challenge in picking your way through through a small periscope with a, a lot of light loss. They had a small chart table and they did take periscope observations and fix their position on the charts. Uh, the two submarines that were recovered uh, gave us the uh, some, some information on, on how they made their way in, but a challenging but not totally uh, impossible proposition as they all demonstrated, they all got in. And in terms of just manoeuvring the submarine, um, keeping it down, you said that that was very, very difficult. Um, what mechanisms uh, did they have at their disposal to make sure the trim was co uh, kept correct? They had a very uh, rudimentary and elementary uh, automatic depth keeping, and that would have been essential because the, you've got one man doing the trim and the depth and the helm, so he's, the, the technician, as it were, is, is very busy. Um, he's also got to go up to the uh, forward bulkhead to uh, initiate the firing sequence for the torpedoes. Uh, so he, he had to be able to leave his post and go forward at, at, the, moment, uh, at the critical moment. Um, they had a, to balance the submarine fore and aft, they had a, a weight which ran along uh, in the overhead, uh, a German idea, and uh, that allowed you to adjust the forward and aft balance. Uh, they had a number of internal uh, tanks that you could let water into or pump it out in order to compensate and keep the submarine neutrally buoyant. Um, not easy, uh, and indeed the motor that ran the bilge pump was also the motor that raised the periscope. So you could use it for one thing but not the other. Uh, so it's certainly a design weakness in uh, making it possible for two men to operate this, keep it safely dived all the time, uh, and they all uh, had problems with it, and they were all seen with their fin out of the water on, on numerous occasions. So certainly they were highly trained, very competent, even 
to have got into the harbour. That's what you'd want to take us to take away from this conversation. Uh, yes. Yeah, this was not a job for amateurs. These people have been well prepared. They had good reconnaissance and good. they had um, admiralty charts at the harbour, so they, they had good charting information to work on. And can I ask you, David Stevens, how well prepared was Sydney Harbour itself for the possibility of such an attack? Well, probably over-prepared in some ways. And, I, and I say, yeah. yes, which is a bit of a paradox. The Australians had got quite carried away with the amount of anti-submarine preparations they were making around the coastline. And that was part of the problem. There was too much going on and not enough concentration on the important ports. And Sydney, for example, was getting had f um, sick, uh, a series of um, passive detection loops which detected the metal of a submarine coming over and there was six loops off the heads and another two inside the heads. Plus there was a harbour defence ASDIC, as in a sonar, which put sound pulses across the harbour entrance and hopefully detected something coming in. And then there was an anti-submarine net a bit further in the, the sorry, anti-submarine and anti-torpedo net across the harbour, which is designed to obviously stop submarine penetrations or even the submarine firing torpedoes through this into the inner harbour. So there was a lot there. And, and there was also quite a lot of, um, there was a lot of volunteers in the um, naval, naval auxiliary patrols, all these volunteer weekend sailors who were putting their patrol boats out there, plus the actual naval vessels that were available for, for um, um, patrolling the harbour. So let me ask, is Sydney then the best protected harbour in Australia in 1942? Yes, without doubt, it was very well protected. And that's the one that the Japanese decided to attack? Because it's the most important one. And there's no point in attacking a non-protected harbour if there's nothing in there that's worthy target. From so a submariner's perspective, uh, I would say it was a sitting duck. The, there were no offshore patrols until there were, uh, after the attack, there were a few aircraft around. These five large submarines were able to operate within 30 miles of the, of the Sydney heads do their reconnaissance and to launch their submarines unhindered by uh, any of the uh, ASW efforts. So what were the main features, Peter Briggs, of their um, battle plan? What were they going to do and what were they planning on doing when they entered into Sydney Heads? Firstly, I think it's, it comes after Pearl Harbour where the midgets failed. Uh, and so there was a a definite uh, enthusiasm to do something quickly and to succeed at it. Um, secondly, they wanted to demonstrate that Australia was not a safe uh, bastion from which the US could mount its attacks back against their, uh, their uh, acquisitions. And finally, they wanted to sink major Allied uh, ships if they could come across them. They divided the the two seaplane uh, carriers by then had lost their planes and so they were kept to seaward of the heads. Uh, the three motherships then divided up uh, in three sectors uh, to the northeast, east and southeast of the heads and they were, well, in, within seven nautical miles and out to 20 nautical miles, so they were quite close into the heads. Uh, their plan was to launch uh, shortly after sunset, which was about 17.45 on the day, uh, and for the submarines to get in at 20 minute intervals uh, into the harbour. In fact, the launching went okay, but all the submarines were delayed, and so they were late getting in. Uh, and the fine coordination then really relied on the experiences of the individual uh, submarines. So would you call it an audacious plan? Uh, yes, it's certainly to walk right up to the major ally harbour in, in Australia uh, and, and launch so close in. And, and the mother submarines then basically stayed in the area uh, unhindered uh, to try for recovery. Um, yeah, audacious, it certainly is. So if the technology had not let them down, was the tactic right? Uh, yes, if they had a, a better design in, in uh, able to control the depth of the submarines, there would be much less queuing and opportunities for ships to fire at them. Uh, there are relatively few sonar detections made, ASDIC detections made on them, and they were generally made only after the, the uh, attacking craft had been alerted by a sighting 
of the submarine virtually on the surface. But the other weakness in the submarines was their lack of uh, air purification in that central compartment, full of batteries generating uh, hydrogen and other noxious gases. And so the, the crew were not in a comfortable place at all. If they'd fixed those two problems, then there would have been a much more difficult challenge for the defending forces, I think. And Peter Jones, what happened then once they actually got into Sydney Harbour? So I think there's two bits to that. One is that uh, in any defence uh, um, regime that you have, you have one is the material defences you have, but the other is mentally, are you actually prepared to, to actively defend a port? And the thing that we see in this situation is that um, the, the Japanese had already, with I-29, had already tried to attack a Russian merchant ship off, um, off Newcastle on the 16th of May. Uh, as David, Stephen said, there were two uh, float plane reconnaissance missions. So there was a number of uh, cues to the defences in Sydney, uh, which were commanded by uh, Admiral Gerald Muirhead Gould, uh, who was a Royal Naval Officer, um, who, uh, interesting enough, had been involved in the uh, review of the, the sinking of the Royal Oak in Scarpa Flood. So um, he was well aware of the vulnerabilities of ports. But he, so he had these indicators, and there was also some uh, intercepted signal traffic that uh, the shore bases thought had come from a submarine off Sydney. Um, so he had these um, indicators that there was potentially some enemy activity off the coast, and he himself had dispatched a number of warships to try and intercept the I-29 after its attack on the uh, on the Russian ship Wellen. Um, but uh, despite that, the uh, navigation lights around the, the port were still burning. Normal uh, civilian traffic was going through the port. Of the eight indicator loops that uh, David has talked about, only one actually worked. Um, and that was the one between, uh, uh, in the inner, one of the ones in the inner harbour. Um, also that the, the large uh, Captain Cook graving dock, which was being constructed, there were large lights um, uh, on towers, which were still illuminating the work going on. So uh, the, the port wasn't mentally ready for an attack. This is despite the, um, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea. So um, when the, uh, the three midgets came in, uh, one by one, the first, the M27, it uh, followed a merchant ship that was coming through the harbour, the Wing, Wingiri. Um, it passed um, over the, the, the one working indicator loop and when they reconstructed what had happened and they went back to look at the traces for the indicator loop, you could see a contact just after Wingiri uh, had passed over the indicator loop. So if the indicator loop team were, were practiced and knew what to look for in terms of what size of a contact in the shape of a midget submarine would uh, come up with a, you know, if you like, the, the blip and the trace, because this was new for them, wasn't it? It, it was new for them. Um, and But once again, it's that lack of training. You needed to be trained in that. And and perhaps, you know, looking back in, in retrospect, they could have towed the, uh, the the Dutch submarine that was in port. They could have towed that across indicator loops just to see what sort of trace that would uh, uh, elicit. But in any case, the, uh, the M27 was able to sneak in behind uh, the Wingiri, but it... Uh, managed to uh, foul itself in the one section of the of the, of the central boom that was in place. It fouled itself, um, and in fact, the watchkeepers who were there uh, as part of the the construction of this boom actually saw the M27, and uh, and one of the workers rode across and identified it as a submarine and reported it to Garden Island. Uh, reported it to, uh, it went through the chain of command to the Admiral, who then asked for more information. But it, um, I think it highlights this thing about people who are going into action for the first time. Some, as we see in this night, reacted in a very 
a positive way. Others were unsure and needed um, to, uh, to get higher authority to do something. So it wasn't that they were frightened and panicked and didn't do the right thing, is they weren't helped necessarily by some of the procedures in place at that time? Would that help? Might be. So I think a good example is the, this, uh, the incident with the M27. So you had two patrol boats which were, if you like, um, armed uh, civilian uh, launchers. Uh, you had the first one which was the uh, Iruma. When it came on scene to where the M27 was, um, it then asked permission to conduct an attack. Um, when the uh, Lolita came along, it came forward and just reported that it was going to conduct an attack and it dropped a number of depth charges. The depth was such that the depth charges didn't go off, but the, um, the Lolita under Warren Officer Anson had a much more positive, aggressive approach. And you see that uh, where I think the uh, Admiral uh, Muirhead Gould, he didn't believe that this was an attack, and even during the, it wasn't really until the cutball was hit that it, he but finally got clear in his mind that this was an something attack. was really happening. Yes. So, what shipping was sunk? Uh, what other ships were damaged in this attack? So, um, so just to follow that story, so the M twenty seven was uh, was fouled hopelessly in the net and was never going to get out. Um, it became clear to that crew that they were being subjected to some sort of attack with the depth charges you know, being dropped and so on. Um, and they set off a, 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 um, a detonation uh, which um, to effectively scuttle that vessel. Um, the, the next submarine to pass through was the M24. It came through once again undetected. Um, and, uh, and so it uh, continued on um, and uh, it was the vessel that was then seen by uh, ships now alerted to uh, to an attack, particularly after the M27 explosion. And uh, and as Peter Briggs said, because the submarines had to come up with periscope to to actually fix themselves navigationally, that's when they then got subjected uh, to uh, attack coming down the harbour and then trying to uh, to identify targets. Um, within this backscattering of lights, harbour lights and so on. And David Stevens, the poor old cuttable was hit. The poor old cuttable was hit. Um, M24 fired two torpedoes. Now, you really, if you have a look at the map, you'll be able to see that um, M24, oh sorry, USS Chicago and USS Patterson, which was a destroyer, were between the attacking submarine and Garden Island, whilst Cuttable was alongside. And M24, under Lieutenant Ban, fired one torpedo, and it, um, which went on the port side of Chicago, and another torpedo that went on the starboard side of Chicago. And one went underneath Cuttable and blew it up, or it actually exploded on the seabed, which broke Cuttable's back. And there was a, the, the Dutch submarine that Peter Jones mentioned was also alongside Cuttable and it was damaged in the attack as well. The other torpedo ended up on the, um, in a pile of rope on the seawall um, of Garden Island. So both torpedoes missed their main target. One blew up, the other one didn't, which is presumed, well, they did do some studies of the torpedo afterwards and it seems to be because the arming um, mechanism didn't work because the, the torpedo actually started off on the surface. It wasn't, its depth keeping also wasn't brilliant. Um, so yes, Cuttable was lost with, with 21 sailors um, uh, who were on board that night. And um, the other one was, uh, was the torpedo was subsequently recovered for intelligence purposes. From a, a Baroness perspective, Van gave himself a very difficult shot. Uh, he used a gyro angle of 60 degrees, so the torpedo went out of the bow of the submarine and turn 60 degrees to settle on its running course. That complicates the firing problem for him. Remember, he's doing it by eye. But it also actually gives the torpedo a lot more problems and risk of failure. It's got a big turn to make, and while it's doing that, it's not coming up to speed, which means it's probably running deep 
uh, or on the surface, as the second one did. So Van would have been given poor marks in his perisher if he'd set himself up for this uh, shot the way he did. Perisher being the submarine command course for those of our yeah. viewers. All right. And, and Peter Jones, you wanted to add something to the drama of that night? Yes, so just to, um, I guess it's important just to understand the timings of this. So, so the, the torpedo attack happened about 30 minutes after midnight. But just uh, an hour and a half earlier, about 11 o'clock at night, um, the M22 was the, so the third submarine. It was coming through the heads and it was uh, actually sighted by HMAS uh, Uruma um, and, um, uh, sorry, not the Uruma, the, the Yandra. The Yandra was one of the, the more uh, capable ASW units, about a thousand tonnes, a four inch gun and some depth charges. And Lieutenant Taplin, who was in command of that, sighted the uh, M22. Uh, he rammed the, uh, the submarine, a glancing blow, and then he conducted a series of, of depth charge attacks in, in the mouth of the harbour. Um, he, in fact, thought he had actually sunk the midget submarine. Um, but the midget submarine had, uh, had in fact evaded that attack, gone uh, deep uh, as much as he could and laid low um, until some of the activity had died down. And it wasn't until about three o'clock in the morning that he then commenced his approach into the harbour, by which stage all the, uh, the, um, uh, all the ships were well and truly alerted to what was going on. Um, and the uh, a lookout from Canimla sighted a uh, submarine periscope and uh, Canimla opened fire and then a, a large number of, uh, of the patrol boats which had all through the night crews had come into Garden Island, manned these vessels and had gone out into the harbour and a, a number of these vessels then zeroed in on to the, uh, the third midget submarine conducted a series of attacks, and uh, and uh, debris started to come from the surface, um, and um, subsequently it was indicated that the crew at some point had also committed suicide on on board. Mm. Now, Peter Briggs, you said that uh, Lieutenant Van would win prizes for his attempt to uh, fulfil his mission and the way in which he did it. Are we to judge this attack by the Japanese? a success or a failure, or their performance as being superior or just satisfactory? Uh, to, to correct the point, Van would have been criticised for criticized. setting himself up the way he did. The easiest way to uh, undertake an attack by eye is to use a zero angle on the torpedo and point the submarine at, at your target. Uh, the target was Chicago. She was lying at a buoy, so she was stationary. The tide was going out, so Chicago was pointing to the west. Uh, all Van had to do was to move to a position on her starboard beam up to the north of her, turn towards straight at her and pull the trigger. Uh, by using his 60 degree left gyro angle, he enormously complicates that. And he chose a firing position that was right back almost astern of uh, Chicago, so his, his torpedoes are not seeing anything like the full length of the ship. And the final uh, point of criticism is this torpedo is a, a in, requires impact to initiate the firing, and when it hits the target at a glancing blow, it's quite likely to bounce off and not detonate at all. So he would have been uh, he would have been told to go back and try again if he <laughs> up that way in, in a perisher situation. Uh, it probably illustrates that you're dealing with fairly junior, and Van was the most junior of the three COs here. The others were lieutenants. Uh, he was a sub-lieutenant. Uh, although they'd been trained, perhaps not too much training in, in the uh, niceties of sinking ships with a torpedo. Uh, the other big failure of the Japanese attack plan was the failure to uh, position the mother submarines outside their heads to attack the ships that were exiting. Uh, he could predict predictably expect to have an exodus of ships in some confusion and hurry, uh, but in fact the mother ships were deployed clear of the heads uh, to recover their, their midget submarines. 
uh, and that seems to be their priority on the day. So in terms of a score out of uh, 1 to 10, uh, they what well, was barely satisfactory. Is that what you're wanting us to understand? Uh, yes. Uh, the other uh, thing from a submariner's perspective, the running depths they put on their torpedoes were too deep. Um, M24 and M27 set six metres, uh, M22 set five. Um, the ships they were shooting at, Canberra and Canberra had six metre draft and Chicago had five. Uh, you'd be much better off at three metres, uh, perhaps four at the most, to shoot at these ships. Um, very real risk with the torpedo depths they had set, but they would have run under and not detonated on the ships. It's a contact pistol. So was it the case that their intelligence as to the draft of these ships was wrong or they just made some bad calculations on the night? Uh, well, they did expect to find HMS Warspite, a battleship in there. Uh, one of their reconnaissance planes on the 23rd saw uh, Chicago coming in. Uh, one of the submarines saw Chicago coming in and misidentified her. But the reconnaissance flights that followed really should have bowled that out. Uh, very obviously, uh, Chicago is not war spite. Uh, from the air, uh, Chicago has three guns in each of its main turrets, uh, and they're very visible. Uh, war spite has two. Uh, so, the, yeah, the reconnaissance failed in identifying the targets and getting that message across to the crews in setting the depths uh, was obviously a, n another failure. And uh, David Stevens, how well did those in the harbour do that night in terms of defending the ships that were uh, at anchor or at buoy? Well, I think when you have to, you, I mean, it's easy with hindsight to look at the mistakes. And as Peter Jones has mentioned, the fact that these people had been trained, but not necessarily trained in this situation. And for the first time for anyone, there's going to be a lot of confusion. Because it sounds slightly like a comedy of errors. There's, there were errors made, yeah. undoubtedly. There were alerts that weren't taken seriously. There were, you know, acts of bravery. But when you look um, at the results, the fixed defences caught one submarine and destroyed it, and it was destroyed there. And the mobile defences caught one of the other submarines, and that was destroyed. So two of the three submarines were destroyed by the Sydney Harbour defences. So if I pressed you for a score between one and ten, was it superior, satisfactory? Was it a five, a seven, or a nine? How would you rate I, it? I'd say it's a, I'd say a satisfactory, six to seven. Right. Um, could do better. Could do better. Would you, like, would you like a controversial perspective on that? <laughs> Can we stop you, Peter? Share your view, please. Um, I, I think the, the, the senior officer planning here was lamentable. There were six, at least six, warnings that should have been heeded and, and uh, were not. And that was a failure of communications through various people and just people ignoring the, the signs. I think the, the guys afloat that night did brilliantly, uh, but they were not backed up by their senior officers uh, who doubted their reports. The Admiral goes down to the, the boom and abuses the ship uh, for doing the sighting. Uh, the captain of Chicago goes back to his ship and stops the ASW measures that are underway and abuses his officers. Uh, you know, the senior, the two senior officers involved here were lucky to keep their jobs. So operationally, uh, a good performance, leadership, command and control, not so good. That's your point. Zero, yeah. And what did the Japanese do after the midget submarine attack before the motherships then vacated the area? Peter Briggs. Well, the motherships waited patiently on the night of the 1st and the 2nd of June in their recovery position down off uh, Port Hacking. Uh, on the surface, at significant risk to themselves in the hope that... Uh, the submarines would return and on the second night two of the mother ships conducted a, a search of the coastline to see whether one had become stranded in there so they were very diligent in trying to recover the midgets which we now know were never going to come back peter jones um and the uh, the other piece to the puzzle there that we just haven't covered is what happened to the third submarine or, or the m24 the elusive the elusive third submarine and and that remained elusive for many many years and there was lots of conjecture about where was it was it somewhere in the harbor and and had been lost and we couldn't identify it and it wasn't until uh 2006 that some recreational divers found the submarine off broken bay um, 
And what was clear by the examination of the wreck of the submarine was it had sustained heavy uh, machine gun damage to its pressure hull, and it was probably from the Chicago. So that's uh, uh, another tally from D David Stevens' um, uh, point that the defences, once activated, were effective. And, uh, and uh, so it had made its escape, but never quite made the rendezvous. But the Japanese submarines, uh, Peter Jones, stayed in the vicinity of Sydney for a little while to try some offensive action? Yes, yeah, so part of the plan was, uh, and this is as characteristic of the typical of the Japanese plans, is that they were uh, quite elaborate, is that each submarine had a, a patrol area to go to after the, um, after the, uh, the attack. And they, if you like, star shelled out in, in different directions, doing different patrols. Um, to, to then attack merchant shipping. Um, and in fact, there were, th uh, in, in those subsequent weeks, there were three merchant ships were sunk, loss of 50 sailors. Um, and then there was a bombardment um, of, uh, of both Sydney and Newcastle on the 8th of June. And perhaps Peter Briggs is probably a better place to talk about the, the aspect of shore bombardment from the submarine. Yeah, what, what difference did that make, Peter Briggs, that they stayed off the coast, that they fired ashore? Did it have much of an effect either on the Navy or on the coastal defences? Well, I think it had certainly had an effect on the civilian population to find yourself under uh, gunfire and when you tucked up in bed. Not a, not a pleasant experience. Uh, in terms of practical impact, not very much at all. Many of the shells did not activate. And so whilst getting hit with a five and a half inch shell at high speed is, is not pleasant, uh, there wasn't as much damage as might have occurred if all the shells had, had detonated. Um, I, I think it was a, just a farewell calling gesture uh, rather than a serious attempt at a, at a military objective. And so David Stevens, there's always heroes and there's always villains. And uh, Peter Briggs has mentioned there were failures in leadership and you've talked about great successes uh, on the harbour that night. Were there people recommended for awards on the one hand and others referred for disciplinary action or perhaps retraining on the other in the light of this attack? Well, I don't like to point to individuals quite like that, but I think we always look at it from an Australian perspective and certainly from the Japanese perspective, all their crew members were promoted to ranks afterwards which indicates how the Japanese saw, saw the raid. Posthumously. Posthumously, of course. Yeah. Um, no, there were no medals awarded for the actions of the, of the, the Australians that night, or the Americans, or the, the, um, the British who were there as well. But you mentioned training just there, and I think that is really a key thing, which, again, Peter Jones alluded to before. Um, training at that stage in anti-submarine warfare was not good. And part of the problem was for that was the Australians didn't have a submarine to operate with. And I know submariners hate being clockwork mice, <laughs> but, but without that practical experience, it's very hard to know. And the comment was made about the fact that the, um, the um, Air Force or the aviation aspects of couldn't find the submarines off the coast. They had one chance to identify a submarine at sea during the war uh, off the Australian, uh, in the Australian area. And that took place in April when a couple of American submarines came down and they were able to play with them. And the, the big result from that was the, um, the air crews saying, we're surprised at how quickly a submarine can disappear mm. and we can't see it once it's down. Which is not something you would think you'd have to find out a month before an attack on your, your harbour. And it just goes to show you the, the lack of training because there were no submarines in the Australian Navy to operate with at that time. And the, the, RA, the Royal Australian Navy was almost as bad in that the last time they'd seen a, a submarine was a British submarine from the China station that had come down briefly in 1939. So no one really had that practical experience of knowing what a submarine looked like, either um, with Mark One Eyeball or with their detection arrangement um, apparatus. Our time's nearly up, but can I ask each of you if you could nominate just one thing that was a consequence of this attack on either the course of the war or the conduct of the war until 1945. Perhaps, Peter Briggs, I'll start with you. Just one thing you think this attack had a bearing on most things or some things that followed? That's a big picture to draw. Um, 
I think what followed really was the that it was the end of, of the use of midget submarines. But there was a second uh, attempt in the Indian Ocean, which was more successful. But uh, thereafter, we don't see midget submarines until uh, the Allies are going back into the Philippines and places like that. And again, they are uh, no more effective in that role uh, either. So, you know, from a Japanese perspective, this was a, a shift, a slow shift, but nonetheless a shift in how they use their submarines. And that's an important thing for the course of the war. Uh, yes, it's important to note that their overall effect of their submarine force in the war was, was, was not particularly good. Uh, and there are, there are reasons for that. Uh, not the least was that they, they didn't have a learning sort of organisation. They were rather uh, mindset and command structure prevented the lessons learnt uh, getting up to the senior officers who were setting out the, the strategies for their submarines. Peter Jones, how do you see this, uh, this attack influencing what happened? Um, I think the thing, if I have one final thought, is, is just really that uh, the, the human cost of this. So we've talked about the loss of the Japanese uh, uh, crew of the three uh, midget submarines, but also there was 21 British and Australian sailors who were killed that night. Um, and I think it's a, there was great personal tragedy with all those 21 and their families. And, and two stand out, the, the two Royal Navy sailors, both of which have been sunk and, and survived the loss of the Repulse and the loss of the Cornwall on board Cardinal, waiting to, to go back to UK when a ship became available, and they were lost that night. And so, so many of these actions is that human aspect that sometimes we lose sight of. Because you'd think it was most unlikely if you were there in Cuddleball that night, you'd think no one's going to pick on us, we're unlikely to be attacked. And of course that wasn't the intention, but that was the result. And there was, uh, you know, individuals who decided to go up to the cross to the night spots that night and they survived. And the guys who will have a quiet night on board Cuddleball and they, they, they didn't survive. Mm. And David Stevens, what ways do you think a particular way in which this action influenced all that followed in the Pacific War. The most important thing for Australia and the war in the, the South Pacific that came out of this was it was the beginning of a wave of Japanese attacks by submarine. The sub Japanese couldn't come south because of the Battle of the Coral Sea. They'd lost the ability for, for sea control. All they could do was send submarines south. Straight after the attack, the convoy system kicked in and all our, um, our shipping between Melbourne up to Townsville and beyond was all done in convoys and it became a major role for the RAN afterwards and it tends to be a forgotten role but it was extremely important because without those convoys without the logistics the campaigns in New Guinea couldn't have happened and the midget submarine was the start of that real submarine campaign that the Japanese undertook. Well sadly our time is up today. My thanks to Peter Briggs, Peter Jones, David Stevens. And to you all for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed this podcast and you'll return for the next in the series. Bye for now.